My name is Jennifer Goss, and I am a full-time high school social studies teacher in Stanton, Virginia, so just up I-81 from some of you. Um, I've been in Stanton now for, gosh, eight and a half years, nine and a half years, I guess it is. It's flown by very quickly, um, and I'm in my 19th year of teaching. I spent the first 10 years in um, a small district outside of Reading, Pennsylvania, and um, I, there I taught um, many of the same classes that I do now, including Advanced Placement U.S. Government, U.S. History, and a Holocaust and Genocide Studies elective. I also had the privilege of teaching, co-teaching an intro film and the Holocaust class in that school as well, um, and have continued with the Holocaust and Genocide Studies elective um, in my new placement here at Stanton High School. Um, so I am a team of one this evening. Um, traditionally, we have a staff person from the Echoes and Reflections team with us, but of course it is the first night of Hanukkah. So for those of you that are celebrating, I hope that your evening is off to a wonderful start and a special thank you for being here with us tonight. Um, I am a United States Holocaust Mu Memorial Museum Teacher Fellow, class of 2010. Um, and had the great privilege of having Karen Plage as my roommate, um, and I'm very glad that she's able to be here with us tonight. And that is also the program through which I met Scott Ostelmeyer, who many of you know from the South Carolina Council on the Holocaust. So I'm going to actually allow Scott to officially welcome us, and then um, if Karen, if you want to add anything as well, we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> um, but Scott, if you want to go ahead and say any type of formal welcome, you can go ahead. Oh, I'd just like to say thank you everybody for being here. Um, I would especially like to thank Jen uh, for agreeing to host this workshop tonight. Um, we're very excited to have teachers uh, obviously from South Carolina, but also from North Carolina and potentially even Georgia as well. Uh, so I think there's a lot to learn uh, from Jen tonight and about Echoes and all the great things that it has to offer. So thank you very much, Jen. All right. Yeah. Special shout out to my buddy, Justin, in South Carolina. We've worked together through the years. So it's great to see you on this program as well. Um, Karen said she didn't really have anything to add, but I'm just really happy that she can be here with us. Um, longtime partners with the North Carolina Council on the Holocaust. And I'm also really excited about this relationship that we're developing with Scott as well. Um, and also welcome to any teachers from Georgia. Uh, you guys are blessed to have Sally down there. And she's, she's also a dear friend. Um, so many of you are already familiar with Echoes and Reflections. We've been around since 2005, and to date we've worked with nearly 75,000 educators now. Um, at the secondary level, our resources are specifically designed for secondary students in the United States to learn about the Holocaust in a way that engages critical thinking and also connections to appropriate relevancy in our students' lives and the world today. And certainly um, with the passage of the Never Again Act, the teaching of the Holocaust um, has become even more newsworthy um, as we move through 2020. Um, but I know that you're, you're both in states that are fortunate to have um, great support networks for educators. And so we're just really truly delighted to be a part of those support networks. Um, so again, for those of you that are just coming in, um, I've placed a document in the chat box for you to sign in on. Um, and if you're unable to access that document for any reason, please go ahead and um, just share your information in the chat. This program is being recorded um, and you will have access to it through your respective councils as well. So if you have any additional questions um, on, you know, you wanna go back and look at something, you'll have that ability also. Um, so our goals for tonight are to um, become furtherly familiar with the content and pedagogical approach of not only Echoes and Reflections, but also our partners at the USC Shoah Foundation and their platform Eyewitness, which is going to be a major focus of tonight's program. And then we're also going to be looking specifically at how the multimedia assets of these two platforms including correlated visual history testimonies and other primary sources um, can be included in your classrooms. And along the way, hopefully adding to your confidence and capacity in teaching this challenging subject area. Um, so to get us started, um, we're gonna dive right into an opening activity. Um, and that particular opening activity is going to be Mentimeter. Um, which some of you might already be familiar with. It truly has been um, a life-saving tool for me 
my particular school situation this fall has been completely virtual. Um, and so Mentimeter has been a tool that I have been using extensively. Um, in fact, used it several times just today with my students. And um, so I will be providing you a link to accessing the teacher facing version of Mentimeter here in just a second. Um, but we're gonna be heading there now and um, thinking about how before we get there, you or your students um, define the word testimony. How do you or how might your students define the word testimony? And I've got that prompt up on the screen and I'm also going to share it with you in the chat box. Also, if you are a North Carolina teacher and can send Karen a private message, she would be grateful for that because um, I know that you guys have some different types of professional development tracking in North Carolina. So if you are able to private message Karen, um, if you are a North Carolina teacher, we would greatly appreciate it. So again, um, you're going to think about how you or if, you know, how even perhaps your students would define the word testimony. Um, and when you get to the mentee, it will populate, and I've got that now up on the screen, what it looks like. And we've already got some answers that are starting to come in. give you all a few moments there. And again, the direct link is in the chat box. So let's go ahead and share just some of the responses that we're getting so far. Um, so this is set up on a, um, on a brick wall type setting um, as far as the Menti display. Um, one of the really great things about Menti, you can do word clouds, you can do polls, you can do um, a scrolling wall. There's all different types of inputs that you can do. Um, you can do even like a sliding um, scale type of setup. And so I'm seeing there and in the chat box responses like relating an impactful real life experience, what someone has experienced, a firsthand account, any primary source information written, spoken, or filmed that provides details of a lived experience, an account of a person's situation or life experience, a personal record of events. Um, my story, a person's story, um, a way to give witness. So I got a little too um, keyboard happy there. Give me just one second. I'm not sure why I can't get out of this. <laughs> there we go. Um, also seeing your personal story with all the triumphs and struggles. My, my screen apparently tonight is just not wanting to cooperate as much as it should. Okay, so I'm just gonna have to use my keyboard. Um, bearing witness to an event, information that's given from an eyewitness about what they experienced, a, a recount of a person's experience. Um, most of my, many of my students would say that a testimony is a shout out. I love that. Um, so lots of great answers here. And one of the other cool things about Menti is that you are able to go back and revisit these answers tonight. Um, and again, if you're having trouble with the specific documents and things that you're interacting with, you can always add your responses in the chat box. Um, I know sometimes with different devices and, and platforms, sometimes interacting with these platforms can be challenging. Um, so if you do have questions or you wanna add your thoughts, you can also do that in the chat box as well. Um, so please feel free to do that. Um, so I'm now gonna take us to the USC Shoah Foundation's website. And we're gonna be spending a lot of time on this website tonight. Um, but one of the things that they have on the USC Shoah Foundation's website that I find particularly powerful to start this conversation is they have a short video on what is testimony. And so I'm going to go ahead now and share that with you. Um, we'll be hearing from the director of the USC Shoah mm -hmm. Foundation, Stephen Smith, as well as special guests like Holocaust survivor Renee Firestone. 
When a person has had a life experience and they reflect on that experience with the distance of time and as they draw on their memory and put that into words and tell us what that memory means to them, we call that testimony. Testimony is when someone shares their experience on something with you and tries to teach you a lesson about something. You get to hear from the real person who actually experienced it. Unlike history books or learning in history, you're able to hear the emotions and like uh, how trauma impacted someone's life. Testimony applies to all kinds of different historical circumstances. For example, you could be a Jewish survivor of a concentration camp, but you could also be a Hutu rescuer during the genocide against the Tutsi, which took place in 1994, or even an eyewitness to the Armenian genocide, which took place in 1915 to 17. Having testimony from a variety of different genocides that have taken place across different time frames and in different places helps us to understand what is the same or similar and what is different, what we learn about genocide generally and what we learn about each genocide specifically. The person is talking about what happened in history, but they're talking about their life. Moreover, they're giving you a part of their life, a deep insight to what they experience, but how they feel as a human being. When you listen to testimony, don't just think about the words, think about the person. In 1994, I gave testimony to the Shoah Foundation about my Holocaust experiences. I also became an interviewer and I interviewed approximately 200 other survivors. The survivors talked about their experiences, where they were born, uh, where they went to school, something about their families, and uh, of course about their war experiences. The interviews were usually conducted in the survivors' homes. They usually lasted two hours, but of course we allowed the survivor to talk as long as they needed to tell their stories. For most of the survivors, giving testimony was a very emotional experience. Many of them told their stories for the very first time. I cried with them many times. For the listener, it's also an emotional experience. So I advise to watch, listen very carefully, and hear what the survivor has to say. So either in the chat box, or if you would like to share out loud, um, you may do so. Let me actually re-pause the video. Um, so either in the chat box or if you'd like to share out loud, um, I'd love to hear something from this video that stood out to you. And if you are an individual that'd like to share out loud, I ask that you just unmute your microphone um, and then I will go ahead and you know call on people whose microphones that I see are unmuted. Um, so Chala, I don't know if you had um, intentionally unmuted your microphone, but if you have and you'd like to share something from this um, film clip that stood out you. I'd love to hear it. Uh, well, something that stood out to me was that I need to pay attention to the reactions as they are listening. I guess sometimes I just teach, 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 and don't bother to really think about how it might emotionally affect the students. Thanks. That's a great observation. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. And I think um, I think sometimes too, like we get so wrapped up in, in watching the testimony ourselves that we then don't necessarily turn and examine our students' reactions um, as they're watching it. So thank you very much. All right, I see some other stuff in the chat box. Um, Cynthia mentions it's unique for a survivor to interview other survivors. Uh, what great empathy the interviewer has. Yeah, Renee is an amazing person. Um, she still does some incredible stuff with the USC Show of Foundation and they're incredibly lucky to have her. Other things that stood out. Um, Denise mentions the fact that the survivor interviewed other survivors is really special and the fact that many of them told their stories for the first time would very much affect Denise's students. Any other thoughts? Okay, so te using testimony in the classroom is an incredibly powerful experience. And I know many of you are coming to tonight's program 
with experience already teaching about the Holocaust in your classrooms. And I'm sure many of you have utilized testimony extensively before. Um, of course, Echoes and Reflections is just one repository of testimonies throughout the United States. Um, but we found some really interesting stuff out this past fall. Um, over the course of the past um, year, we conducted a survey with U.S. college students. And um, unfortunately, our survey dropped two days before this year's claims conference findings, which many of you are aware uh, suggested that today's younger generation lacks historical knowledge about the Holocaust um, and also voiced concern related to the diminishing ability of survivors to bear witness over time from quickly becoming a reality. Uh, our survey did find uh, some different things out, and it, it also was not really as much of a survey about facts and figures, but instead a survey about what learning about the Holocaust in high school or middle school then carries on with a student as they enter their university experience. And um, our recent survey, which was conducted in conjunction with Lucid Collaborative, actually showed that there's a significant impact that our efforts are already having on students. And there's some quotes from the survey um, up on the screen now. Um, but one of the things to me that I found most um, interesting about the survey was that there were significant differences that suggested that students who learned about the Holocaust through survivor testimony had greater comfort with people of different backgrounds, they had greater openness to viewpoints that were different from their own. And they also had a greater sense of responsibility to help others who were less fortunate. And this really shows the potential impact of incorporating survivor testimony in teaching about the Holocaust. Um, students also specifically scored higher in critical thinking skills and social responsibility. They also were more likely to identify as justice-oriented citizens with greater levels of interpersonal tolerance and social agency, as well as having greater levels of civic efficacy, which for me as an AP Gov teacher made me really excited, um, and also um, possessing stronger intergroup relations. And so as testimony is our focus tonight, with this program, I'd like you to think about not only the ways that you can use testimony necessarily to teach about the Holocaust, but also as we explore both Echoes and Reflections and the Eyewitness platform, how you can look to bring testimony into your classroom in other ways. We'll be building bridges from our principles of pedagogy, which many of you are familiar with. Um, these principles of pedagogy are available on the Echoes and Reflections website, and I'll share that link with you here in just a moment. Um, things like using primary sources, which of course testimony is one of those. Um, encouraging your students to think critically and to um, make the Holocaust relevant in appropriate fashions. Um, to define terms, and I'll show you our fantastic audio glossary that can help achieve that goal. Um, providing students historical context. It's always important for them to understand that the Holocaust did not happen in a vacuum and we have resources that can help provide that foundation in your classroom. And I know also many of the workshops that your um, state organizations do also provide some great foundations for that. We also encourage that you ensure a supportive learning environment. Um, those of you that have worked with me before have heard me say this, but I go back to my mentor and dear friend, Elaine Colbertson, who always told me you wanna lead students safely into this topic and also lead them safely out, that it's our responsibility as educators to do that. And truthfully for me, in a lot of my um, teaching of the Holocaust, I use testimony as my safe in and my safe out. And I'll share with you tonight one of my favorite safe out testimonies. Um, fostering empathy statistically has been shown to occur through the use of um, testimony. And then also that allows us to teach the human story. And along the way, testimony can also be utilized to perform that all important duty that we have to teach students about the history of anti-Semitism. So whether you're teaching about the Holocaust for a day or you're teaching about it for months, you wanna ensure that your students do have some background on what the history of anti-Semitism is. And we'll talk a little bit about ways that you can achieve that tonight. Um, 
So I'm now going to drop a link in the chat box to our principles of pedagogy if you'd like to access them to learn more about um, as you know after the program we do have some deeper resources. And since I am a um, team of one tonight my link dropping might be a little bit slower than normal but we keep the ship moving. Um, and so you know, as we're going through the, the work that we're doing tonight, I do want you to think about how these pedagogical principles already exist in your classroom, and then also how you can further enhance them, perhaps even through some of the very resources that we'll be exploring this evening. So right now, um, I am on the main website of Echoes and Reflections, um, and we're going to be navigating through this site here. Um, I'm also going to share with you in the chat box an infographic that I've created for tonight that has some of the key links um, for our um, session tonight so that you don't have to worry about writing all of these links down. Um, the infographic has links to the Echoes and Reflections website. It also has links to the resources that we'll be utilizing in Eyewitness. So on the main Echoes and Reflections website, when you land there, this is our current landing page. And you can also see an easy link to that survey that I previously mentioned. Uh, our teach resources are really the hub or the core of the Echoes and Reflections website. This is where we're gonna find further information on those pedagogical principles that I just mentioned. It's also where we're gonna find our audio glossary, which is a really strong resource, particularly for those of you that are doing virtual and hybrid learning right now. Um, when I'm teaching my unit on the Holocaust or for my actual Holocaust courses, I take and pin this audio glossary at the top of my learning management system. We use both Canvas and Google Classroom. That way it's always accessible to my students so that they're able to refer to the glossary as we're covering content in class in case they have questions and may not understand a word that is brought up or even a word that they might hear in a testimony. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this resource already organized alphabetically, giving basic definitions to words that students are likely to encounter about the Holocaust. But another kind of side feature of it that I think is really awesome is I know as a young educator, I encountered a lot of Holocaust-related words like Belgitz, for example, that I didn't know how to pronounce. And nobody else in my department taught about the Holocaust, and so I didn't really have anyone to easily pronounce it for me. Um, so you no longer, no longer have to fake it till you make it. You can go here Bugets. and hear it pronounced for you. And so you can use this as a little practice um, point for you as an educator. Another asset that's available under our teach resources is our timeline of the Holocaust. And the timeline is a really strong asset to use in conjunction with eyewitness. The timeline is one of our newer assets and it's an asset that's constantly being added to. So if you've looked at it previously, but it's been a while, I strongly encourage you to revisit uh, the timeline when you have the opportunity. Um, because it has so much content, it is one of our slower loading assets. So um, just be forewarned that if you are having students do activities with it and those students have low bandwidth, um, you just want to make sure that you give them time to load the timeline um, or that you can also go over here to the right hand side and it pops out and you can actually download the timeline as a PDF, which is text only, but that can also be beneficial for students that are in um, internet um, poor environments where they don't have good bandwidth. Um, the timeline begins in 1933 and stretches to 1945. Of course, the events of the Holocaust precede and, and post-date that, um, but these are the years that we chose to focus on. And as you scroll down through, you'll see that for the events, every event is um, the date, what has happened, and then an image. And then if you click on the event itself, you get a deeper explanation of the event. And then you also have additional primary sources, as well as some secondary sources in some cases, um, like this handout on what concentration camps are. <laughs> we also have this additional testimony from Herbert Kahn, which is not part of the core Echoes and Reflections resources. And then we also have this great little two-minute video on um, the Nazi camp system from our partners at Yad Vashem. So the timeline um, can also be an outstanding asset to use as we're navigating these virtual environments. 
I'm now going to take us back to the main Echo site um, and use this as our launching point for our foray into eyewitness this evening. And when you click on the lesson plans segment of the site, you'll see that the lesson plans are organized here along the left hand side into 11 units. Um, now they're in units, but the units do not necessarily have to be taught in this chronological order. I know many of us are very tight on time. And so one of the things that I really appreciate about these teacher resources is that you kind of have the ability to go through and pick and choose what best fits in your classroom, or perhaps you've been teaching about the Holocaust for many years and you're just looking to change up a few things, you can go in and pick and pull stuff that best works for you. Um, and if you go into a lesson, like we'll go into the survivors and liberators unit here, um, each unit is organized in the same fashion. Each unit begins with an opening quote. In this case, our opening quote is from Anton Mason, who was actually a peer of Elie Wiesel. Um, and in his testimony, he makes the very pro profound statement, we are free, but how will we live our lives without our families? And so each unit begins with a quote pulled from one of the testimonies or resources within the unit. Every unit also has the audio glossary terms that fit with that unit along the right-hand side. I'll forewarn you, it's really easy to be glancing around Dachau. and then accidentally hover over one of the speakers. It causes me to jump probably at least once a week. Um, we also then have preparing to teach this unit, which is a great overview of unit content um, based on whether or not you've teach the Holocaust before. It's a great review, or if you're new to the topic, it's also a great way to get some key context and background. We have academic standards alignment for the Common Core. We also, in many of our lessons, have video toolboxes, which are short 10 to 15 minute overviews, largely geared towards teachers and how to teach about the topic, but some of them, like this particular one, can also be student facing. And then every unit has a copy of our testimony video guide, which lists all of the testimonies within Echoes and Reflections. And it organizes them by unit, the lesson within the unit, the name of the person who's speaking, what they're speaking about, and the length of the video clip. So what's really handy is if you know that tomorrow you're going to be teaching about the Nuremberg Laws, you'd love to have a testimony on it. You just hit Control F for find. And then you say, oh, look, here's Herman Cohn, and he is talking about the Nuremberg Laws for 40 seconds. That's great. I can preview it and likely use it tomorrow. And then if you click on it, it takes you directly to the testimony itself. We then also recently added our asset resource guide, which has all of the non-testimony items throughout Echoes and Reflections that are primary and secondary sources. We also have links to our activities within Eyewitness as well. Um, and when you click on the title and link to the resource, it takes you directly to that particular um, asset. The timeline also has a separate asset guide for all of the assets in the timeline. And so for me, it's a great search tool. Um, like for example, if I know I'm teaching about propaganda tomorrow, I just go in and type in propaganda to our assets and I see that I get nine separate hits, one of which is the title of the lesson plan, but then the others are all assets here on the right hand side of the page. Back in the lesson plan itself then, um, we have step-by-step -step lessons with the correlated activities on the right hand side of the page um, and we give questions to prompt discussion with students. We have handouts that can be shared directly with students. Um, if you, for example, click on um, this testimony here on a liberator's thoughts, which just gives an overview from a gentleman who liberated a camp, you just go up at the top of the screen, you clip the URL and you post it in your Google Classroom or Canvas, and it takes students right to this very clean copy, easy to read, and it's also printable in that format as well. And then as you scroll down through at the bottom, <clears throat> you'll see reflect and respond questions, which are great journal prompts and class discussion prompts. 
Then we also have additional making connection suggestions for um, all of the other things that can be done related to this topic and additional resources that we have and various partners that we work with. Um, so that is an overview um, of Echoes and Reflections website. Does anybody have any questions before we head into Eyewitness? If you do, you can feel free to unmute your mic or share in the chat box. Oh, so great question, Stacey. Um, the video list is up here at the top of every single lesson. It's this testimony video guide. So pinned at the top of every single lesson is that testimony video guide. And I'll drop the link for you in the chat box as well. Um, but that to me has been an absolutely amazing resource to have with Echoes. And then by the way, every single testimony, um, they're also, as I said, shown here on the right-hand side of the screen. When you click on the testimony and bring it up, through Echoes, it gives you what I call a bio brief about the individual to give your students a little bit of background on who they are. You can play the testimony right in Echoes itself, or if you start the testimony and then click YouTube, it'll take you to the YouTube link for the testimony so that you can then clip the URL the last, and embed uh, it three days in, in um, Google Slides nothing. or another, uh, you know, presentation program that you might be using, or you can give your students the direct link to YouTube if you have YouTube access in your school, bring them into ed puzzles, et cetera. And then also for every single survivor, in addition to that bio brief, we have a more full biography. Um, I personally like to hit the printable version to read it because I just think it gives me a cleaner copy to read. And you can go through and see um, all of the background here on Dennis who has actually a very interesting um, background working for counterintelligence at, in the aftermath of the war. Um, he was himself was liberated by U.S. forces in Dachau. Um, so he's a, a really interesting guy. Any other questions about the core ECHO site? All right, so within every ECHOES lesson, you'll also see links to eyewitness activities. And so these are activities that were created in partnership between the USC Shoah Foundation and ECHOES and Reflections staff. And they're specifically aligned with various aspects of our lessons. This particular activity here is one of my favorites. It's called New Beginnings Journey to America. One of the things that I think is often overlooked when we study the Holocaust with our students is the fact that the war ended, the camps were liberated, but then we often don't think to talk about what next. I know in the state of Virginia, for example, our standards address the Nuremberg trials, but they say nothing about displaced persons camps or the experience of survivors in the aftermath of the, the war. So I absolutely love assigning this activity to my students. And it is one of um, several types of eyewitness activities. And what I'd like to invite you to do now so that we're able to explore this activity together is I would like you to, if you have the infographic open, you can click on the link in the infographic or in the chat box. I'm gonna put the link to eyewitness. I'd like you to go to Eyewitness and either um, log in if you have an account or create a free educator account. Just take a few moments and head to Eyewitness. And again, as I said, if, you've if you have an account previously, great, log in. If not, you can go ahead and create an account. They are free. And if you're, for whatever reason, on a device, if you're accessing this webinar from a phone and you're not able to create an account just now, that's okay as well. Everything that you're gonna need to see, 
you can see from your phone tonight. All right, so with eyewitness, um, there are many different things that you can do. When you log in, you actually land on what is known as your dashboard. I love the dashboard for a lot of reasons, but one of the biggest reasons why I love it is because it's accountability. So you can see every single one of your students that you interact with, and we'll talk more about that interaction here in just a little while. You can see the last time that they logged in, and then there's also other tools that you can use to track what they've done. Um, and so if, if Johnny's like, oh yeah, miss, I went to that website last night and I tried to do the homework, but I just, I mean, I submitted it. You just must not have gotten it. You can see if Johnny actually logged in, you can see if Johnny accessed the activity and if Johnny actually completed any of it. Um, so it's a great tool for accountability. And I'm always sure to tell my students that it prevents a lot of those little Johnny stories from happening. Um, in the dashboard we also have some great videos here along the left hand side that are topical it can be used in class like just the general concept of refugees or the genocide against the tootsie in rwanda if you just you know are teaching world history too and need some type of overview on that we've got tools for that we also have stuff on the guatemalan genocide the armenian genocide we have some educator facing videos like guidelines for teaching with testimony and then we also have some really great student facing videos like ethical editing, because one of the opportunities that eyewitness provides for them is that they are able to make their own videos. They get free access to the WeVideo video platform. Um, and Angelica, I'm actually going to talk about that here in just a little while. We'll talk about how to how to give your students access as well. Um, so the um, Dashboard has these resources. It also has the ability for you to track groups that you're associated with um, and also to navigate activities that you've recently assigned. Um, so my dashboard's quite busy. I use Eyewitness not only with my students, but as a consultant for the Shoah Foundation. So I've got a lot of different activities and things going on here. I promise yours will not look as cluttered. The first thing that I'm going to invite you to do once you're logged in, or even if you haven't finished your account yet, is to go up to the watch feature here at the top of Eyewitness. Watch is a collection of dozens and dozens of pre-curated, pre-vetted testimonies that are aligned to specific topics. The watch testimonies are available in multiple languages, so if you have students who are ESL students in your classroom, you might be able to find some testimonies in their native language. Um, about the topics that you're learning about. For our purposes tonight, I'm going to sort down to English related clips. And you'll see here that not only are there Holocaust related topics like anti Jewish laws and, um, you know, things like displaced persons camps, but we also see more general topics like choice and dilemma, community, courage. We also see alignments to other um, elements of genocide. I'm not really sure why my computer just decided to go that way. Um, but uh, other elements of genocide. We see the Adana and Hamidian massacres from the genocide in Armenia. We also see anti-Rohingya mass violence. These testimonies are very new. They're the newest testimonies to our collection. Each and every single topic, like for example, civil rights in America, um, which I'd like to invite each of you to click on, has clips of testimony that you can see by flipping through above um, the individual's name. So it says like Leon Bass, you can go to the next clip um, and flip through and you'll see that there are eight in this particular topic. Each watch feature also allows you to download the clips to your computer if you have an unstable internet connection or to save the clips. They also have activities that relate to the topic. So we have many activities in Eyewitness that talk about civil rights issues. We also have other links to related topics within WATCH. 
We have terminology that your students may need definitions on. We also have resources that might align with some of the testimonies and individuals that you hear from. And then we have my very favorite, which is the graphic organizers. And so what I would like to invite you to do now is I'd like to invite you to go into the civil rights watch component. I'd like to invite you to scroll down or use the link that I've put in the chat box and open the graphic organizer um, that allows you to do critical analysis with Soapstone. And it'll download a PDF, which then you'll open. Peter is going all kinds of haywire tonight. And when you open it, you'll get a fully fillable PDF. And I'd like you to go through and just pick one of the testimonies in the civil rights component of watch. I'd invite you to watch it. And I'd invite you to, to play around with the Soapstone graphic organizer. I'd also like to invite you to mute um, the Zoom portion um, of your computer's broadcast right now, because I'm going to play a testimony for those of you that don't have the ability to do eyewitness from the device that you're on. Um, but for those of you that would like to, to experiment with you here on your own, go ahead and mute, and we'll come back as a full group at 8.20. And so I'm going to share with you um, the very first testimony um, this is the testimony of Dr. Leon Bass. Leon Bass was an incredibly amazing individual who was born, um, lived, and died in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And he was a liberator with the U.S. Armed Forces of the concentration camps in Europe. And he's going to specifically talk about being denied the right to live in a dorm um, after he registered at Westchester University, which actually happens to be where I earned my graduate degree. And so um, something that I was quite sad to learn about um, although Dr. Bass did often come to Westchester um, during the years that I was a student there and speak to students, he was an incredibly amazing man. But I want to share with you his testimony now. I went out to Westchester and went down to the college. And I registered and became a student there, that institution. And that was a good time for me, a happy time, because I was the first one in my family to go to college. But then I found out something. I found out that the face of evil was in Westchester. It was in the town and it was in on the college campus because shortly after registering, I found out that I couldn't live in the dormitory. That was not possibility for me, merely because I was black. I it's hard to describe my feelings because I had done so much. I laid my life on the line. I put in three years in the military and here I'm being denied what I was fighting for. So that, that did sit well with me and I was still that angry, angry young man. So if you're able to pull up the graphic organizer, go ahead and think about some of the things that you might enter related to Leon's testimony. I'm going to display that graphic organizer on the screen for us. In case you're just following along and you just want to think about some of these components. And I invite you in the chat box to share if you're following along with me. Like if you want to say speaker, who he is, what little did you learn about him from what I told you? or the occasion, or the audience, or the purpose, or the subject. You can share any of those things with us in the chat box.
All right. So Denise mentions when Leon states that he served in the military, could not live in. The, um, he served in the military, but he couldn't live in the dorm because he was black. It's a really powerful statement. It was resound well with um, powerfully with students. I think Angelica is finishing her thoughts, so we'll give her a chance there to share. Yeah, the face of evil was here in Westchester. It's a profound statement. Cynthia mentions um, he may have wanted others to understand his confusion at being denied his civil rights after fighting to liberate others on foreign soil. Marcia mentions the purpose of Leon's testimony is to show how dehumanizing these experiences cannot, can be. Um, and Angelica mentions, um, although he's speaking, and I'm not sure what the rest of the, the tone part was, um, but feel free if you want to, to reshare um, that in the chat box as well, or any other things that stood out to you. It's okay. Um, although he's speaking in a calm tone, you can still hear the frustration and anger in his voice. Yeah, the memory still lingers. All right, so everybody um, now should be unmuted. So we're gonna continue on um, with our conversation. Um, I'd love to hear some thoughts in the chat box or if there's anybody that would like to share out loud and you wanna unmute your microphone and share, um, just some thoughts on using watch. What stood out to you? What testimony maybe did you watch? What were some things that, that you thought about as you were utilizing these pieces and these components and maybe even perhaps how they could fit in with your own classroom? So what do we think? Um, so Lynn's excited about the variety of topics. Um, Marsha says the videos are brief, but still very powerful. Um, Cynthia mentions they're way more interesting than reading. Yeah, my students definitely think so and more personal and touching. And Stacy mentions as well, the graphic organizers are a great additional resource to use while utilizing the videos. And um, sadly, as many survivors are leaving us now, it's a very valuable resource. As I mentioned, they're pre-curated and pre-vetted, so we don't have to worry about the historical accuracy um, within these testimonies. Of course, one of the challenges sometimes in using testimony is that memory is fallible. And we have survivors that are recorded largely in the 1990s, and so they're remembering things that they might have actually read about and not experienced. One of the most famous things we see um, is survivors that have been to Auschwitz always saying that Dr. Mengele did their selection. And um, we know that Dr. Mengele didn't arrive in Auschwitz until March of 1943. So people that arrived before that, that, that didn't happen. But I know many survivors who did remember that. Um, and it's just because it's something that they read so much about and so they, they kind of incorporate that into their memory and so we've done the heavy lifting with the vetting in the watch feature um, and so you're able to use these particular resources with confidence. Um, Amanda also mentions there's multiple topics, the videos are short and engaging and Scott mentions that the Soapstone guide um, makes it really easy, easily usable in conjunction with the videos and they do help um, hold students responsible. So I attach the PDF in um, Canvas Google Classroom. And then I give my students the link to watch and I tell them, okay, you know, we're gonna go to this topic. For example, when we were studying contemporary anti-Semitism, I sent them into the topic with one of the graphic organizers actually allows you to compare three different testimonies. Um, and so I use that particular compare and contrast of sources that can also be used with other primary sources. And I said, you're to watch three testimonies. We've got 20 minutes. 
and you are able then to fill the, the PDF in and save it and submit it to me. And the PDF absolutely can be downloaded. Yeah, so, um, and then also the glossary um, also comes in to help you with those unfamiliar words. So watch is, is what I call the kind of the first step into using eyewitness. I think with great confidence, most of you could walk into your classrooms tomorrow or sign on to your classrooms as it is 2020 and utilize this feature. The next feature that I'm gonna introduce you to is activities, which is where we were a moment ago with that new beginnings in America activity. In the activities section, um, we have nearly 500 publicly accessible activities now in Eyewitness. Um, you see a few more on my screen just because of, of some of the development work that I'm doing. Um, our activities began very simply as InfoQuests. InfoQuest asks students to go through the four C's. Like all of our other activities, we ask students to consider where they learn background information on a topic or individual. We then ask them to collect where they collect pieces of testimony and perhaps other primary or secondary sources. We then ask them to construct something, which I'll talk more about in just a moment. And we then ask them to communicate it where we ask them to share with their classmates. And this is very similar to the NCSS C3 framework approach. So for those of you that have social studies backgrounds, you probably recognize um, the consider, collect, construct, communicate. In an InfoQuest, um, we ask students to collect words, to create a word cloud based on a specific clip of testimony that they've used. And then they retitle that clip of testimony with their own title. They write up a brief description of it. They share that and their word cloud with their classmates and have a conversation digitally about their word cloud and their clips. Video activities use the Wii video video platform, which I'll share with you just very briefly here in a little bit, to actually give students the task of collecting testimonies and primary and secondary sources to construct their own little mini documentaries, which again, they then share with and comment on their classmates. Those were the two initial activities that Eyewitness was built upon. Then about four years ago, we came out with mini quests. Mini quests are my personal favorite. Mini quests are able to be printed out, all of the materials with a mini quest can be printed out and given to students if a teacher just has a single computer and a projector. So if you're in a low tech environment, a mini quest is the perfect activity because it allows for flexibility with whether or not the students have computers that they're able to access. The mini quests also have varying product outcomes. Some mini quests ask students to create a public service announcement. Others ask students to create um, a collage or a poem or a journal. The lessons um, are 15 to 45 minute long pieces within Eyewitness, again, fully downloadable, meant to be utilized with a single computer. And the lessons are um, really now wide reaching. Some of them are created for what we call mindful explorations, which are great with student advisory classes, and they're centered around topics like courage, like empathetic courage, moral courage, intellectual courage. Um, we also have a mini lesson on countering extremism and anti-Semitism with Christian Piccolini, who some of you may recognize. Um, we also have mini lessons that are topical. Um, for example, bringing students into to not be able to find a, a topical one very easily, but we have one, for example, on the um, Great Fire of Smyrna um, during the Armenian Massacre. So it's just a short lesson on that. And then we also have lessons to build other skills, like effective listening skills, effective conversation skills, civic responsibility. So if you have colleagues that are teaching government, for example, you can share eyewitness with them and they can find lessons that will complement what they're doing in their government classes. Then we added geo stories. Um, we only have 10 geo stories right now. Um, the geo stories are um, specifically built to encourage geographical thinking um, in students. They have students um, building what they're constructing is a testimony and timeline based experience. Um, and Echoes and Reflections actually just created one recently um, with the National Geogra Geographic Alliance standards in mind on understanding displaced persons now. 
Then we have our iWalks, which allow students to take a virtual field trip. Presently, um, the one that's available is to the Horowitz Wasserman Memorial Plaza in Philadelphia. And then lastly, we have our interactives, which I'm saving for the end of our program tonight. So I'm gonna take you now back to that new beginnings activity. I have a particular soft spot for this activity and I'll share more in a moment as to why. If you are signed in to iWitness, I'm gonna drop the link in the chat box and you're gonna be able to follow along with this activity on your own screens. This is an info quest, so it's one of our more basic activities and again, a great way to get started in eyewitness. Every single activity has an opening screen which tells you some of the national standards that it's aligned with. The estimated completion time, which truthfully, I think we overestimate. Um, I have students that are able to complete this activity in about 45 minutes. Um, they have some familiarity with eyewitness by this point, but they are able to complete the activity in about half the time. Then it gives you an overview of um, what the activity is and tells us what students will be doing. And then it also allows you at the bottom several actions. And in a moment, we're gonna talk about how to establish students and groups, which you can assign the activity to. Once you're really familiar with eyewitness, you can also copy the activity and make modifications to it. Like let's say you wanna bring in the voices of North Carolina survivors, or South Carolina survivors that are emigrating to the United States. You can do that through um, the copy feature. So as I mentioned, the consider is our first C. Um, when we go into a topic, um, we are sometimes given a document, we are sometimes given a video, um, and right now we have this video here that I'm going to share with us on new beginnings, uh, the journey to America. Allied victory brought an end to Nazi terror in Europe and to the war in the Pacific. However, the liberated Jews, suffering from illness and exhaustion, emerged from concentration camps and hiding places to discover a world which had no place for them. Without their homes and families, and reluctant to return to their pre-war homelands, these Jewish displaced persons, or DPs, were joined in a matter of months by more than 150,000 other Jews, fleeing fierce anti-Semitism in Poland, Hungary, Romania, and the Soviet Union. Most sought to begin a new life outside Europe. Palestine was the most favored destination of Jewish Holocaust survivors, followed by the United States. American immigration restrictions still remained after the war, and legislation to expedite the admission of Jewish DPs was slow in coming. President Harry Truman favored a liberal immigration policy toward DPs. Faced with congressional inaction, he issued an executive order, the Truman Directive, on December 22, 1945. The directive required that existing immigration quotas be designated for displaced persons, allowing for increased admission of DPs without any rise in overall immigration. About 22,950 DPs two-thirds of whom were Jewish, entered the United States in the next two years under these provisions. Congressional action was needed before existing immigration quotas could be increased. In 1948, following intense lobbying by the American Jewish community, Congress passed legislation to admit 400,000 DPs to the United States. Nearly 80,000 of these, or about 20%, were Jewish DPs. The entry requirements favored agricultural laborers to such an extent, however, that President Truman called the law, quote, flagrantly discriminatory against Jews. Congress amended the law in 1948, but by that time, most of the Jewish DPs in Europe had gone to the newly established State of Israel, founded on May 14th, 1948.
All right. So then after by 1952, 137,450 Jewish refugees, including close to 100,000 DPs, had settled in the United States. The amended 1948 law was a turning point in American immigration policy and established a precedent for later refugee crises. Got it. a little excited for the end there, um, a little early. Um, so after the video, then students are um, asked to go into the toolkit, which is here to the right. Every activity has a toolkit. It has the learning goals and requirements. It has several downloadable resources for the students, including the reference displaced persons handout, which we're not going to take the time to read right now. It also has all of the biographies of individuals whose testimonies are used in the activity. Educators then have a special tab, which is not accessible to students, which includes a rubric for the activity. And I know that in the next round of updates to eyewitness, these rubrics are also going to be like fully clickable. So you can actually grade them in the platform like you would if you were using an LMS. Everyone also then has access to the USHMM's encyclopedia, as well as that of Yad Vashem and Nyad. There's an additional glossary. And then there's also a spot for you or your students to make notes. So if you use this activity, but then know that you want to make adjustments to it, you can create notes to review the next time you go back to it. Once they've read the displaced person's handout, they move to the next slide where they're asked some questions to get some background, you know, thinking about the background of the topic. So we would ask, what were some of the problems faced by DPs after they were liberated from the video and from the handout? What would students say? How, what was President Truman's position on post-war immigration to the United States? Why was the amended 1948 law a turning point? And then the challenges that we think about people would face when immigrating to a new country, thinking specifically about the, the Jewish DPs who arrived in America after the war, but of course allowing students to make connections to present day as well. And then once they've gone through that, it's giving them directions to the next segment, which is going to be to select a topic of testimony to watch. So we have six testimonies um, that you're able to watch and you can click and hover over them um, where it tells us about who the survivor is and what their basic clip is about. So we've got Renee Firestone, we've got Martin Arone talking about his journey to America and his impressions of arrival in New York City. We have Paula Tenser talking about her experiences en route and then the meeting of family once she arrived. We have Congressman Tom Lantos who discusses his experience aboard the SS Marine Falcon. Um, and then Erna Analik who shares her memories about a ship stalling and an opportunity that leads to her marriage, which is a cool story. And then Sidonia Lacks talking about her initial experiences in America from the viewpoint of a brave young girl. So my personal favorite is the testimony of Tom Lantos, but it's actually a little bit long. So for tonight, since we've already met Renee Firestone, I'm gonna share her testimony instead. Um, and I think you'll see why it's a testimony that too might touch students. In America, what did you say? Uh, I arrived to Allentown, Pennsylvania. It's, it's very interesting. I want you to know that I'm going uh, next week to Prague to my father's graveside where I'm going to meet my brother who is going to be coming back from Israel where he's visiting now. And I'm going to go from Prague to Israel. So in the, we will meet in the middle. And this is the first time that we're going to be back together and uh, visit my father's gravesite, on which, by the way, before we left, we engraved my mother's and my sister's name, since they didn't have a grave. And I came to Allentown, Pennsylvania, on the 31st of October, 1948. And it will be on 31st of October that I'm going to be returning this time from Israel. And it was not planned. I just, when I, when I saw, saw it on paper, I realized. And I remember my brother-in-law waited for us at the airport. And uh, I, I came with my daughter, who was then 11 months old. My husband stayed back. He, he got 
got his visa a little bit later, and he wanted to go to England, where he was a young brother in an orphanage. Uh, he was taken by the UNRWA, by the way, to an orphanage in England after the war. And uh, um, the plane landed in, uh, in New York, in the LaGuardia, we arrived to the LaGuardia Airport, and everybody was getting off the plane, and the captain came over to me and he said, uh, you can't get off, you have to wait. And I said to myself, they are going to keep me here? Uh, what's the problem? I thought maybe something with the child, or they are, are going to send me back. I was terribly frightened. When everybody was off the plane, then he said, well, uh, we can go now. He took the child from me and walked me to the door of the uh, stairs, of the, the steps of the plane, handed me the child, and he said, now you can walk down. And downstairs, some uh, cameras were taking my picture. <laughs> and that's the picture I have uh, on the mantle. I will show you later when I arrived. Uh, my uh, brother-in-law uh, apparently arranged it. Some newspapers were there. I was one of the first um, refugees coming to Pennsylvania at Valentown. There was a big article about us. The interesting thing was that finally my brother-in-law was waiting for me at the airport and uh, drove us to Allentown. And when I arrived to his home, he, he had two children. One was 10 years old, one was 8 years old, Michael and Susan. And they were dressed in costumes. And I said to my brother-in-law, why are these children dressed in costumes? It is not Purim. And he said, no, it's Halloween. And I said, what is Halloween? <laughs> So this time when I come back, I, I know what Halloween is. Did you? All right. So, um, how do you think students would respond to Renee's clip there? In America, what did you? Uh, you can share in the chat box. Or anybody's more than welcome to unmute as well their story of Halloween. Um, they would probably be surprised. Yeah, Ali mentions that, that they didn't know what Halloween was. Yeah, I think um, some of my students are, didn't they? Don't they have Halloween, um, they would say, um, in Europe? And that would, would likely stimulate some interesting conversations as well. Yeah, so once a student would select their testimony and watch it, um, they would then have to choose eight words that describe or explain the interview's experience in the story. Mine still um, apparently was clicked on Tom Lantos. Um, so they have to, they, you know, type a word in. Um, he tells a really funny story about oranges in his story. And so they might say like oranges and then they can expand the word. They can change the color of the word. Um, and then once they type their eight, next cool part is, they then have to explain why they chose these words. So they can't just type eight random words and have them work um, for the activity. Um, Marla also mentions um, they'd be able to relate to her through her warmth and they can make connections with Halloween and Purim, some of our students can. And um, Denise mentions the fear that she had when she was told to wait to get off the plane also might stand out. Then from there, students move into the construction of their clip. Um, they replay their clip and then they have to provide a title and relevant quote for their word cloud. And they're walked through that activity. So what would their title be that could best describe the words that they shared? And then what would be a quote from the story that they think to be meaningful and important? And then the final step of it is um, they get to make a, a, write a description about their information quest that, they would, that would be seen by their classmates. 
And they also get to see the inputs of their classmates here on the right with the word cloud. So all of the students in my classes through the years that have completed this activity, it's fed into this big word cloud, which you also as an educator have the ability to download. And then the final step of the activity is the actual um, interaction with the students. So my students this year, um, you know, they wrote their descriptions um, and then they could go in and make comments on one another's descriptions um, and, and fill different things out. And so then you have the ability to, to see those comments and see those interactions with the students. Um, so that's an information quest. And I'm sure everybody's wondering, okay, so how, do you know what your students are doing? How do we know what they're writing? Well, our next step is to create students and groups. And on the infographic that I provided you, um, the students and groups link is available. So you'll have that to refer back to, but I'm also going to drop it here in the chat box for us. Um, this particular um, page for me is already heavily populated with many of the classes that I've had. To get started, you make a group. You can call it whatever you'd like. So I'm calling it test. You can even upload like an image of your class there if you want. Um, and then once you make the group, it creates a key code. And so what you then do is you give your students the eyewitness.usc.edu URL and you give them the key code. And you may have noticed that when you logged in, you were given the opportunity to register as a student or a teacher. They would obviously choose student. And they would simply input this key code. Once they input that key code while they're registering, they make their own username, they choose your, their own password, but they are automatically dropped into your class. And so I'll show you what the class looks like. So it tells you all of the students that are registered in the class. Then you can also, with a student, because, you know, let's face it, we all know this is going to happen. A student forgets their password. You would click on their name. And then you can edit their information, which allows you to reset their password. You can also assign them to additional groups if you would have them in multiple classes. Like, for example, I use Eyewitness in my AP government class as well as my Holocaust and Genocide Studies class. Um, and then you can see their progress on specific activities. We actually did the new beginnings activity, so I can check Reese's progress. And so it tells me that she chose Erna's video. It tells me some of her responses to the questions that were asked. I can even add comments to her things. I can look at her word cloud choices. I can see why she described her word cloud as she did, her new title, her quote, and then her brief reaction with the summary. And then I can also see had she made comments with her classmates, which she for some reason did not, I would be able to see the comments that she made here as well. And so it's single screen. It's really easy for grading. What I do now is I have my Canvas, my rubric open in Canvas. I just tab back and forth between this tab and the tab in Canvas where I have my rubric. Um, and I'm able to then easily grade the activities. And I'd be more than happy if any of you do teach in Canvas and want to do an info quest, I'd be more than happy to share my rubric with you. Um, so that is the student and group page. And I can also see all of the activities that I've assigned students in that class, um, as well as video projects that I specifically created for that class. Anybody have any questions about students and groups or activities? Okay, so before we get into what I call the coolest part of eyewitness right now, I just want to very briefly show you the video projects segment, especially for any of you that are National History Day teachers. I know Scott um, was a, a former National History Day superstar, so um, wanted to make sure that I highlight this for you. Um, but the video projects use the We Video video platform, and they allow you and your students to create projects both inside of activities as well as outside of activities. So if you want to make, for example, virtual teaching this year, 
I wanted my students to compare two testimonies, one which was from Echoes and Reflections, one which was from a survivor who's in Echoes, but this particular component of her testimony was not. I was able to create a really nice blended video of both of their testimonies using Wee Video. And then you can download the video and upload it to whatever platform you want to use it in. Um, but just to show you, like you can add lower third. I had a wonderful time. I had uh, my mother and father. And, I had and so I was able to add that lower third to hers, which was already labeled. Um, ITGAS was not. So then I was able to upload um, a lower third to ITGAS, which I can fast forward to. Nothing I could do. We just were really vegetating, if you want to call it that. So. A child. I loved music. I loved songs. I loved story. And fortune for my parents and grandmother. Were and I actually, for those of you that are familiar with Margaret, I blended two of her testimonies together. So an added feature of the Wii Video platform. Um, you could import, I actually made a documentary about my dad and his experience in Vietnam um, using We Video through Eyewitness. So you can do so many different things with it um, and use it, you know, and bring in testimonies from inside and outside of the platform. And it's free. It's easy to use. I had a colleague that retired just a few years ago after 40 years of teaching, and she used Eyewitness and used the We Video video, video editing platform. So it was super amazing. So we're in the process of launching a new version of Eyewitness, and you'll see here in the upper right-hand corner that you can preview the new version of Eyewitness Beta. Um, but one of the key components of the new Eyewitness is the Dimensions in Testimony. And some of you might be familiar with Dimensions in Testimony through 60 Minutes. Um, and we, um, what Dimensions in Testimony essentially is, is that the USC Shoah Foundation spends an intensive multi-day process recording um, testimonies of individuals, in this case, survivors of the Holocaust, in a virtual reality studio that will ultimately lead to the creation of a hologram that can be displayed. Some of you might have seen them in places like USHMM um, or the museum in Skokie, um, and they're in, they've been in other places throughout the United States. Um, we set up the Dimensions and Testimony and Eyewitness as a um, four-part um, activity, just like the other activities that consider, collect, construct, communicate. Um, but the collect is where the really cool stuff happens. Um, the consider part gives them background on Dimensions and Testimony and then ends up um, with the um, student developing questions that they will then ask their survivor. And this is going to take a little moment here to load. So we'll give that a second. Um, and I also see, uh, um, yeah, Heather, the, the, um, Heather mentioned in the chat box, one of her students was selected as part of the 2021 student cohort working on testimonies. Um, Eyewitness has a junior intern program, which is really phenomenal. I had a student who did it last year, and especially one of the positives of, of the situation with the world right now is that students from all over the United States can participate in these junior intern programs. So stay tuned for info on that. Um, so once your students have developed their questions, they then have the opportunity to interact with the survivor, in this case, Pinterest. So, Pinterest, how old are you? I was born in 1932, so you can make your own arithmetic. Pinchas, where were you during the war? Uh, during the Holocaust, I first lived for the first couple of months after the war started in my hometown in Łódź, and then we went as Polish Christians, because Jews weren't allowed to use the trains anymore, uh, at the end of 1939 to Warsaw to stay with an aunt of mine. And for the rest of, until the middle of 1943, until, until May of 1943, I lived first outside the ghetto because the ghetto wasn't formed until the end of 1940. And for about two and a half years, I lived inside the Warsaw Ghetto. And of course, after that, I was sent to concentration camp. 
Are you married, Pinchas? I am married. Who is your favorite football team? I'm afraid that I cannot answer that question. What is your favorite food? My favorite food is gefilte fish that I make according to the way my mother used to make it. So that's just a small sample of the really cool things that you can do with Dimensions and Testimony. Um, I'm so excited about it. <laughs> Angelica and I are on the same um, path here. Um, and you saw what happens too when you ans ask a question of him um, that he doesn't know the answer to. Um, Ava Moses Core is another one of the survivors that we are working on um, getting her DIT accessible to students. Right now, Pinchas is the only one, um, but I can also tell you really quick who the third one is. Um, you guys will only be able to see Pinchas through your access to eyewitness, but I can tell us really quick here who our third one is. Ava's really cute when you ask her her favorite food. She talks all about McDonald's. Um, and so that was that was something I thought that was really neat. All right, and so um, our third one is um, Annika Lasker Walfish. So um, she she's the third survivor, and she's not someone that I'm I'm very familiar with. Um, so we're getting to the end of our program this evening, um, and I do um, want to again say thank you um, to both the South Carolina Council on the Holocaust and the North Carolina Council on the Holocaust for allowing us to come out tonight and share echoes and reflections with you, as well as um, the amazing resources that we have that intersect with Eyewitness. Um, the virtual dimensions and testimony you can find under the activities tab, absolutely. And right now it's also on our front page of Eyewitness um, because it's a new feature. Um, I honestly, Ali, don't know when the other testimonies are going to be available. Um, everything was supposed to be available in November, but unfortunately with COVID, some things have slowed down a bit, so I'm not entirely sure. Um, thank you, Scott, for having me. I, always wonderful to work with teachers um, in both of your great states just south of mine, and I look forward to working with you guys in person again in the hopefully near future. Um, and if anybody has any additional questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat box. Um, I also just really quick want to call attention to um, the uh, online survey link that is at the bottom of the infographic. Um, and I'm also going to post that link for you in the chat box as well. Um, if you can just, before you head out tonight, take a moment to head to that online survey. Um, and I'm having a bit of a delay. I apologize with getting that link up for you, but it is now in the chat box. And if you can just head there before you head out, I would so sincerely appreciate it. Thank you all again. Um, and again, if there's any further questions, um, please feel free to ask in the chat box. Great to see some familiar faces um, and hope to see you all again soon. <laughs>